Good morning and welcome to Country Bible Church, friendliest church in Kaufman County. Our call to worship this morning is coming from 2 Peter, 1st chapter, verses 16 through 19. For we did not follow cleverly devised myths when we made known to you about the power and the coming of our Lord Jesus Christ. But we were eyewitnesses to his majesty. For when he received honor and glory from God the Father, and the voice was borne to him by the majesty glory, this is my beloved Son, with whom I am well pleased. We ourselves heard this very voice, born out of heaven. For we were with him on the holy mountain, and we had the prophetic word more fully confirmed, to which you will do well to pay attention as to a lamp shining in the dark, until the day dawns and the morning star rises in our hearts. Heavenly Father, Lord God, thank you for allowing us to come to worship you. Thank you, Lord, for the many blessings you've given this church and the many people that are here just to worship you, not for a fellowship, not for a social club, but to worship you, Lord. We ask that you be with us, that we open up our hearts, our minds. You be with the pastoral staff that brings a message straight from your word. These things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen.
missionary focus this morning is on the Genesis Center. 
they're almost completely full, which is a blessing. You can look how much the Word of God is getting out. They do have a uh, school which is going to be opening up inside the Genesis Center this next year. They're going to start out with uh, K and then move it up every year and get another great progressive one. But the school isn't an ordinary school. It's a school for kids whose parents are incarcerated. You figure if your kid's in regular school and they find out you're, hey, your parents are in jail, they're in jail, but you know, they're all kind of bullying that can be going on. Well, this is going to be a safe haven school for these kids, which is going to be inside Genesis Center. Uh, it's going to be its own separate ministry, but they're located there. And it's going to be from all over Kaufman County, kids whose parents are incarcerated. Again, it'll start with pre-K, and then every year it'll add a year all the way up. They don't know how far it's going to go, through graduation maybe. And they will have uh, Bible classes and Bible studies in it to help enrich and to grow the kid well-rounded, not just uh, academics, but they have sports and all kinds of things that are being planned right now. So keep the Genesis Center and this uh, new ministry that they're also helping to uh, the floors. Secondly, uh, Tim and Christy, Tim's not here, Tim and Christy's nephew, Cordell Reynolds, uh, passed away yesterday morning in a car accident. Please pray for his parents, Eric and Melanie Reynolds, uh, and he has two brothers, uh, Dylan and Blake. Uh, also bring your attention to uh, Burl Nichols, Andrew's 94-year-old grandfather. He's been diagnosed with acute myeloid leukemia. It's progressive and rapidly growing leukemia, and they say that there's not really a long-term cure for this. They're not, they're not sure, but it needs to be treated real quickly. But he's 94, and he's decided he's going to sit and think about it for a while and pray about it and see if that's something he wants to go ahead and pursue or just to let God take his course. Uh, on a happier note, Sue's sister-in-law, uh, Holiday, finally had her surgery. Been reading about it for about three months now. But she had her surgery last week, and the surgeons were very pleased about the outcome. Uh, she'll be in the hospital for the next few days, uh, but it's definitely a praise. Uh, we're good to hear on that. As you can see, we have several prayer requests in the uh, bulletin. Read those. Hold on to them during your prayer time. Lift these people up, each, each and every one of them. Let's take a moment for personal prayer. family as they mourn this tragic accident that happened yesterday morning ask that you be with them and they can lean on you at a time like this and be with Burl Nichols as he uh, is deciding through you through your word through talking to you Lord what the course is that he wants to do He feels that at 94, he's, he's lived a good Christian life. He lived, he's, he just doesn't know what he wants to do right now, Lord. Stay here and serve you or come and be with you. Thank you for Holiday. 
had that surgery and everything's looking good for her. Lord, thank you so much for the blessings that you've given that family. Lord, bless that you be with these others that we have on our prayer list. Uh, Bucky, Cephas, Judy, all these others that are listed here. I want to give you praise for what you've done to help them. I want to ask that you be with those that need your help. Be with those that need to lean on you, Lord. Bring their cares to the cross to lay them down so that you can comfort them. We ask that you be with this congregation that's going through the New Testament, reading as a group, as a church, as a body. Be with them that they can be true to you and that they can continue to read through this study plan that we have. And we ask for blessings on Mike Nichols and Mike Nichols, excuse me, Mike Wilson and his family this week, Lord, as he's serving deacon. Be with him and his family in the service of the Lord. We ask that you be with the pastoral staff today, Lord, to bring your word to us. In Jesus' name.
found that to be true, that all other ground is sinking sand. Everything outside of who God is and the way that he's called us to live is all sinking sand. And when we say things like, it's on Christ, the solid rock that I stand in, everything else is out of bounds. And we know that to be true. And David penned this in the book of Psalm. He said, I waited patiently for the Lord. He inclined to me and heard my cry. He drew me up from the pit of destruction out of the miry bog. And he set my feet upon a rock, making my steps secure. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. Let's pray. Oh God, it's so true. Blessed is the Lord. Blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust. God, that we would place our trust in you. That we would resist, God, the, the lies of the enemy that seeks for us to put our trust in other things. Broken cisterns that can hold, that can hold no water. Oh God, may we set our feet on the solid rock of Christ, immovable, unshakable, this rock. Oh God, we thank you for grace. And you've been so good. You've been so faithful to us. Even in the times when we've been unfaithful, God, we recognize that your steadfast love endures. So God, we thank you and we, we recognize that you are God. And that you're good. I hear the cry of your people. God, may we place our trust solely in you. And it's in this precious name of Jesus that we pray. Amen. <laughs>
you turn to Daniel chapter 11, say a huge thanks to Bailey for bringing the message last week. Appreciate you, Bailey, very much. And know our people do too. Always great to hear when others bring the word. We are working our way through the book of Daniel, and we are just about to the end. Today, you're going to want to take a very deep breath um, as we work through chapter 11. We're going to read this together. It is lengthy, so prepare yourselves, and we will get through it together, and then we will really dig deeply into some of this stuff and see uh, where the Lord takes us here uh, next week, we will be wrapping up Daniel, which is hard to believe, with chapter 12. So if you want to read ahead in Daniel chapter 12, please do that. Um, and then it's going to be Easter Sunday, and we'll talk about what's next um, coming up. So let's start in Daniel chapter 11, and we'll go with verse 2 this morning. Where the messenger says to Daniel, Now I'll show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia, and a fourth shall be far richer than all of them. When he has become strong through his riches, he shall stir up all against the kingdom of Greece. Then a mighty king shall arise, who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. As soon as he has arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven, but not to his posterity, nor according to the authority with which he ruled. For his kingdom shall be plucked up and go to others besides these. Then the king of the south shall be strong, but one of his princes shall be stronger than he and shall rule, and his authority shall be a great authority. After some years they shall make an alliance, and the daughter of the king of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the strength of her arm, and he and his arm shall not endure, but she shall be given up, and her attendants who fathered her, and he who supported her in those times. And from a branch from, and from, a branch from her roots one shall arise in his place. He shall come against the army and enter the fortress of the king of the north. He shall deal with them, and he shall prevail. He shall also carry off to Egypt their gods with their metal images and their precious vessels of silver and gold. And for some years he shall refrain from attacking the king of the north. Then the latter shall come into the realm of the king of the south, and shall return to his own land. His son shall wage war and assemble a multitude of great forces, and shall keep coming and overflow and pass through, and again shall carry the war as far as his fortress. And the king of the south, moved with rage, shall come out and fight against the king of the north. And he shall raise a great multitude, but it shall be given into his hand. And when the multitude is taken away, his heart shall be exalted, and he shall cast down tens of thousands, but he shall not prevail. For the king of the north shall again rise in multitude, greater than the first. And after some years he shall come on with a great army and abundant supplies. In those times many shall rise against the king of the south, and the violent among your own people shall lift themselves up in order to fulfill the vision, but they shall fail. And the king of the north shall come and throw up siege works and take a well-fortified city. And the forces of the south shall not stand, or even his best troops, for there shall be no strength to stand. But he who comes against him shall do as he wills, and none shall stand before him. And he shall stand in the glorious land with destruction in his hand. He shall set his face to come with the strength of his whole kingdom. He shall bring terms of an agreement and perform them. He shall give him the daughter of women to destroy the kingdom, but it shall not stand or be to his advantage. Afterward, he shall turn his face to the coastlands and shall capture many of them, but a commander shall put an end to his insolence. Indeed, he shall turn his insolence back upon him. Then he shall turn his face back toward the fortresses of his own land, and he shall stumble and fall, and shall not be found. Then shall arise in his place one who shall send an exactor of tribute for the glory of the kingdom. But within a few days he shall be broken, neither in anger nor in battle. In his place shall arise a contemptible person, to whom royal majesty has not been given. He shall come in without warning and obtain the kingdom by flatteries. Armies shall be utterly swept away before him and broken, even the prince of the covenant. And from the time that an alliance is made with him, he shall act deceitfully, and he shall become strong with a small people. Without warning, he shall come into the richest parts of the province, and he shall do what neither his fathers nor his fathers' fathers have done, scattering among them plunder, spoil, and goods. He shall devise plans against strongholds, but only for a time, and he shall stir up his power and his heart against the king of the south, the great army. And the king of the south shall wage war with an exceedingly great and mighty army, but he shall not stand, for plots shall be advised, devised against him. Even those who eat his food shall break him. His army shall be swept away, and many shall fall down slain. And as for the two kings, their hearts shall be bent on doing evil. They shall speak lies at the same table, but to no avail, for the end is yet to be at the time appointed. And he shall return to his land with great wealth, but his heart shall be set against the holy covenant. And he shall work his will and return to his own land. At the time appointed, he shall return and come into the south, but it shall not be this time as it was before, for the ships of Katim shall come against him. He shall be afraid and withdraw, shall turn back and be enraged and take action against the Holy Covenant. He shall turn back and pay attention to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. 
forces from him shall appear and profane the temple and fortress, and shall take away the regular burnt offering, and they shall set up the abomination that makes desolate. He shall seduce with flattery those who violate the covenant, but the people who know their God shall stand firm and take action. And the wise among the people shall make many understand, though for some days they shall stumble by sword and flame, by captivity and plunder. When they stumble, they shall receive a little help, and many shall join themselves to them with flattery. And some of the wise shall stumble, so that they may be refined, purified, and made white until the time of the end, for it still awaits the appointed time. And the king shall do as he wills, he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god, and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished, for what is decreed shall be done. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all. He shall honor the god of fortresses instead of these, a god of whom his fathers did not know. He shall honor with gold and silver, with precious stones and costly gifts. He shall deal with the strongest fortresses with the help of a foreign god. Those who acknowledge him he shall load with honor. He shall make them rulers over many and shall divide the land for a price. At the time of the end, the king of the south shall attack him, but the king of the north shall rush upon him like a whirlwind, with chariots and horsemen, with many ships. He shall come into countries and shall overflow and pass through. He shall come into the glorious land. And tens of thousands shall fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand, Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites. He shall stretch out his hand against the countries, and the land of Egypt shall not escape. He shall become ruler of the treasures of gold and silver and all the precious things of Egypt, and the Libyans and the Cushites shall follow in his train. But news from the east and the north shall alarm him, and he shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. And he shall pitch his palatial tents between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, and he shall come to, the, to his end with none to help him. Woo! All right. Good job, everybody. You made it. The word of the Lord. It is good. It teaches us and instructs us, even when it takes a long time to read it and we're really unsure about what we've just read sometimes. It still works on our hearts. Everybody loves a good mystery. When I was younger, I read Agatha Christie's, uh, and then there were none, really enjoyed it. So a couple of years ago, when Rebecca asked uh, me, and she was like, I need something to read, I want something kind of, you know, a mystery or whatever, I had seen that Murder on the Orient Express had come out as a movie, and I was like, hey, we could watch that together, you should read that book, and then we'll watch it. And so she read it, and then we got to talking about the movie, and she was like, oh yeah, and, and I just love the way blah 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 happened at the end, and, how, and I was like... I haven't read this book. We're going to watch this movie together. And it just kind of ruined everything. But that's okay. It's fine. <laughs> Nobody likes to be spoiled when it comes to a mystery, generally. Well, I, actually, I know some people who oddly do. Some of my good friends, actually, they, when they read a book, they, they open it up. They read the, the table of contents, the first several words, and then they skip to the end, read the end, so that they know what they're going to be reading all the way through. I think that's extremely bizarre, but I know that people do that. In a culture that has information that is everywhere, it is harder and harder to maintain any, any level of mystery with really anything. It's very difficult to keep yourself from being spoiled in anything you want to, to keep from being spoiled about. It's not as much mystery as there used to be, perhaps. But something that is, and is absolutely not a mystery as well is the past. Sure, we, we've lost many records of certain things. We don't know much about others. Certain Native American civilizations remain a mystery to us. If you're interested in, in the Incas or, or the Mayans, you, you may be wondering what happened there. We don't know necessarily. But generally, we do have a pretty good idea of what has happened in the past. Because it's the past, and it happened, and someone kept record of it a lot of the time. It's history. That's why we call it that. But in God's economy, history encompasses not just the past, but also the present and the future. For God is not bound by time, rather he sees and is present in it all, all at once. I know that's an extremely weird concept. I think Wayne Grudem summarizes it well. If you, you want some just light reading material, check out his systematic theology. But he says something like this, in God's perspective... Any extremely long period of time is as if it just happened. Any very short period of time, such as one day, seems to God to last forever. It never ceases to be present in his consciousness. Thus God sees and knows all past, present, and future with equal vividness. 
We could go on and on, but it's a, it's a pretty interesting concept to think of God being outside of time and seeing all time as it happens. Neither past, present, nor future, then, holds any mystery to God. We might love surprises, but God has really no concept of them, for he does not experience surprise. He might surprise us. Jesus, in his humanity, was apparently surprised by certain things, but God is not surprised, which ought to be a really, really great reassurance for us. And in fact, God is a bit of a plot spoiler. He doesn't just reassure us with knowing of his knowledge of all history, past, present, and future. He also reveals enough of it to us to kind of take a lot of the mystery out of it. God surprises us in a lot of ways. But the trajectory of time and the overall way that history plays out from one century to the next, God has spoiled that for us. We're not going to get to wait till the end to find out. But he spoiled it for our good. Indeed, the thought today is that history is not a mystery. And remember, when I'm talking about history today, I'm not just talking about the past. I'm talking about time in God's economy, past, present, and future history. God showed Daniel in chapter 11 here a very detailed look at the big events of the next several hundred years after him. That's where we are in Daniel. This messenger had come to him, given him this vision. We had begun to kind of break down the introduction to the vision in chapter 10. And this is the meat of the vision. And what it is, is the next several hundred years laid out for Daniel to see what's life going to be like for Israel. How are they going to sit? What, what, what are these kingdoms they're going to be under? Like... So it was no mystery what would happen to the world that Israel was part of. It was not mysterious at all, because it's right here in Daniel chapter 11. Let's give a super short preview of, or kind of overview of this prophecy. Because we've read it all, I don't want to go back and read all of it. I want to hit some high points and, and just kind of show you what's going on. The prophecy says that there will be four more kings in Persia. Now, Daniel was sitting under the kingdom of Persia at this point. Remember, Babylon at this point had come and gone. Daniel remained instead of going home to Israel. He stayed there, served in the Persian court. And the first thing is verse 2. Now I will show you the truth. Behold, three more kings shall arise in Persia, and a four shall be far richer than all of them. So there's going to be four more kings, not just the one that Daniel is sitting under them. There's going to be four more, the prophecy said. Then the prophecy said that Greece would take over, reigning the empire around the area. Persia would be no more. Greece would come in. Then it would split into four pieces. These are things we've looked at. Verse 3. Then a mighty king shall arise who shall rule with great dominion and do as he wills. As soon as he's arisen, his kingdom shall be broken and divided toward the four winds of heaven. Two of those kingdoms, we know, would emerge as world powers and vie for domination. Verses 5 through 20 there in chapter 11 are all about that. And you, as we were reading, hopefully you just caught king of the north, king of the south, king of the north, king of the south. Those are these two kingdoms that the Greek empire would eventually be divided into. Then one of the rulers from the north would be despicable and terrifying. We read that near the end. Verses 21 through 35. Look at verse 21. In his place, being the end of these kingdoms, shall arise a contemptible person to whom royal majesty has not been given. He shall come in without warning and obtain the kingdom by flattery. And the next 15 verses are all about this big time ruler that is being prophesied here. And all these events... Persia, Greece, the division of Greece into four kingdoms that eventually became two. Then one of those kingdoms assuming a huge, massive role with this great and evil contemptible ruler. All of these things prophesied of in Daniel chapter 11 were very, very specifically fulfilled in history. This is prophecy. It's very specific. And it really lays out what's going to happen. And it was all fulfilled. This prophecy, Daniel chapter 11, is, is like a script for a hundred years long movie. Everything goes according to script. For hundreds of years. Now we've talked about Persia already. Let me show you briefly on a map what we're talking about. Okay, so here's our Persian Empire. Right here. Big Persian Empire. That's the very first part of this prophecy. 
Okay, it extended, it was huge. What a, what a massive empire it was. There were several more rulers in Persia. Historically, we can go back and read. They were, just like the prophecy said in verse 2. That was Israel's 5th century B.C. plight. They lived in that empire. Okay, you can see as we look at different maps, notice this is where Israel is, the land. And Israel is going to be really central to all of the empires that are happening here because that's what this prophecy is about. It's about what they were sitting under. We've talked about Greece already. We've done it multiple times. But here we go. So we move from Persia. This is the, the Greek empire under Alexander the Great. Very much the same kind of territory. Israel's still there. Very much so. Alexander the Great rose to power. Then after he died, his kingdom was split into four kingdoms between his uncooperative generals. Here we go. You can see the color change there. There's one kingdom, two kingdom, three kingdom, four. Four kingdoms. Again, Israel sitting. And notice where they're sitting, right on the edge of where the kingdoms may begin. That was Israel's 4th century BC existence. Two of those generals ended up ruling the most powerful kingdoms, which Daniel had heard the prophecy about. One in the north, up here. One in the south, down here. And so when you read king of the north, king of the south, this big kingdom here took over this whole area. This kingdom down here took over this whole area. Just like that, it happened. That was Seleucus and Ptolemy. Those were the two generals that took over, and their dynasties would be kingdoms. That was Israel's third and second centuries B.C. plight. That's what they lived under. Scholar Trimper Longman says, The story of the second and third centuries B.C. is an account of how Israel passed back and forth between the Ptolemies and the Seleucids. Those two kingdoms, Israel sitting right on the border, they are warring. That's what all the rest of this chapter is about. Going back and forth, king of the north takes over, king of the south takes over, king of the north. Back and forth, and Israel sits right at the center of it. And the details here, all these details that we read in Daniel 11 that were somewhat exhausting, can be completely traced in history. We could sit here probably... For a while, and have a history lesson, which I'm not going to give you, where you can see how every single thing here was fulfilled. You can grab a history book if you're really interested in seeing that. But let me give you one example. Verse 5. It says, Then the king of the south shall be strong, but one of his princes shall be stronger than he, shall be stronger than he, and shall rule, and his authority shall be great authority. After some years, they shall make an alliance, and the daughter of the king of the south shall come to the king of the north to make an agreement. But she shall not retain the strength of her arm, and he and his arm shall not endure her. But she shall be given up, and her attendants who fathered her, and he who supported her in those times. A very specific, kind of bizarre, weird kind of prophecy between these two kingdoms. The Net Bible gives some really helpful historical context for, for this, for verses 5 and 6. It says here, they, refers to Ptolemy II, Philadelphus. Again, these are real people. This happened in history. And Antiochus II, Theos. The daughter, that's in verse 6, refers to Berenice, who was given in marriage to Antiochus II, Theos. They continue. Antiochus II eventually divorced Berenice, remarried his former wife, Laodice, who then poisoned her husband, had Berenice put to death, and installed her own son, Seleucus II, Callinicus, as the Seleucid king. That's what verses 5 and 6 are about. That's exactly what happened in history. HBO would have had a field day with this. We talked about Antiochus IV Epiphanes already several weeks ago. Actually, we'll go back here. Yes, perfect. Antiochus IV Epiphanes, we talked about several weeks ago. He was a ruler from the north. And he was despicable, and he was terrifying. Verses 21 through 35 are all about this guy. Prophesied about this terrible, terrible, terrible ruler. And that was Israel's mid-2nd century B.C. plight. They sat under this guy for some years. And all the details about Antiochus IV Epiphanes can be traced to this prophecy. Again, let me give you one example. Verse 29. At the time appointed, he shall return and come into the south, but it shall not be this time as it was before. For ships of Katim shall come against him, and he shall be afraid and withdraw, and shall turn back and be enraged and take action against the Holy Covenant. He shall turn back and pay attention to those who forsake the Holy Covenant. And that Bible shows us in history what happened. Well, Roman forces led by Gaius Populus Linnaeus, 
confronted Antiochus when he came to Egypt, demanded that he withdraw or face the wrath of Rome. Antiochus wisely withdrew from Egypt, albeit in a state of bitter frustration. Those verses described it in prophecy that played out exactly that way in history. The bottom line that we see from all of these things is that everything prophesied about here in Daniel chapter 11 happened just like God said it would. So it was certainly no mystery then to God. He had it mapped out. He had it heading toward a certain direction. A direction that apparently was for the good of his people. God didn't have out his, his go-go gadget magnifying glass trying to figure out clues to when the next event was going to happen or where the next war or battle might occur. And so it didn't have to be a mystery to God's people either. For one, he gave them a general outline of the remainder of history right here, especially their, their little bit of history in those several hundred years. What we've looked at so far would be their near history. It wasn't a mystery. Then the end of the chapter, verses 36 on, seems to be the far-off end-of-time history. It wasn't going to be a mystery either. They got to see what the future was all about and where it was heading. To see just this one time how God sees all of time, all the times. Grudem gives an analogy like this. When you read a book, as you're reading it, you only understand it in its timeline as you get pieces of it, as you go. But that moment when you read the last several words and you close the book, you've read the whole thing, and now you can see the timeline of that book in your head in completion, can't you? You can see, in a way, all of that time occurring as if it's one big chunk, whereas you had only ever seen it in little bits before. That's an imperfect analogy, but it's similar to how God sees time. He sees it all at once. Whereas we only get bits and pieces moving forward. But with this, God gave his people a chance to see it in a way, in a small way, the way he sees it. For a time. Yes, most of the details, absolutely. There's a lot of details here that aren't given about Israel's history. They're unrevealed. And so they are absolutely mysterious. This prophecy didn't give Israel an itinerary for their day-by-day -day lives, did they? When I make an itinerary where I'm going somewhere, it is extremely detailed. I, I put it down to, to, to at least the quarter hour. If Rebecca makes an itinerary, she just wants to know, hey, what are we doing sometime today? At some point, don't give me the details, just give me a general idea. This is kind of that general idea. There's a lot of details that, that were left out and given to Daniel. But this showed them that if the big events of history have beginnings and ends that are set by God, then the small ones do too. The small ones do too. Was there mystery to Israel's future history? Yes, of course there was. They didn't know everything about their future. But was there any uncertainty? No, there was not. There's a big difference between those two. It is a mystery. I'm, I'm bringing you up a lot today. This is fun. It's a mystery to why Rebecca will stay married to me. That's a mystery. But I'm not uncertain that she will, am I? We are left in mystery about so much about God, but we are not uncertain of his existence or his goodness or his grace. And the Hebrews' world was in many ways just very predictable as a world. There was a lot of mystery in it, things that only God knew that he wasn't going to let them in on, absolutely. But there were lots of cycles in the Hebrew world and in their history that made things very knowable, very predictable for them. I recently was at this museum of sorts, and there was this, you, you've seen machines, simple machines that are made, and they can, they can keep 
uh, you know, balls moving back and forth, and they never stopped. I love those kind of things. And we're watching these things go, and it had all, it raises the, the little marble up, and, it, and they go, and every once in a while, one goes on a different track, and the next one goes on a different track, and you just never really know which track it's going to take to get to the bottom and then be raised back up. There's mystery in it, because you're not sure which one it's going to go to, but there's still a level of predictability, isn't there? Because there's just a generalized track. I don't know where it's going to go, but I know it's going to go in one of these. And I know how it's going to get, it's going to end, it's going to go to the bottom, and it's going to come back up. Cycles. Like the law of gravity in nature. Hebrews didn't really call it gravity, they didn't know that, but they knew that what went up did come down. Israel lived out the events of this prophecy for several hundred years, watching the rise and fall of king after king, kingdom after kingdom. They all rose to great power. What goes up? Then they all fell from it. Must come down. None of those kingdoms pursuing God's kingdom. There was greed and lust and power struggle and murder that would put Game of Thrones to shame. That's what chapter 11 is about. None of them lasted all that long. God wouldn't allow these empires to do so. God would only put up with each evil empire's evil for so long. When the, when the noise level finally gets to a point in your car on a road trip where you're like, ah, it's time. I've got, I've got to cut this off. You allow it for a while, but eventually you're like, no. It's the same kind of idea. God allows it. God allows it. And then he cuts it off. Each kingdom's strength, all these kingdoms that would rise up here, that strength that they had, it meant something. It really did mean something for a while. But then it faded. It always faded. It was the same predictable pattern every time. And so, even when Israel got under the worst of the worst persecutors, they were then able to say, oh yeah, I mean, I know where this is going. I know where it's going. I can see where we are in the cycle. Cue Antiochus Epiphanes and his rise to power. They were ready for it. This ruler, Antiochus, in 2nd century BC, would defy God. We've talked about this. Verse 21 in his place shall rise a contemptible person. He was a contemptible person. Verse 28. He shall return to his land with great wealth. His heart shall be set against the holy covenant. He was against the people of God. That's what Antiochus was. Verse 31. Forces from him shall appear profane the temple and the fortress. He profaned God's temple. He would persecute God's people. Verse 33 predicted, The wise among the people shall make many understand, though for some days they shall stumble by sword and flame, captivity and plunder. He persecuted the people of God. That happened. Verse 35, Some of the wise shall stumble so that they may be refined, purified, made white. Persecuting to the point of martyrdom. Many of them. Antiochus, Gave the death penalty to Jews who circumcised their sons. Gave the death penalty to Jews who kept the Sabbath. Gave the death penalty to Jews who used a scroll to read the Torah. Antiochus only allowed sacrifice to Zeus or pagan gods. Did so in the very temple that the Jews worshipped in. Antiochus and his, had his tax collector pay Jews who would then turn on their countrymen, giving them away. Antiochus slaughtered 80,000 Jews, we know from the historical book of 2 Maccabees, including women and children, because of an insurrection that displeased him. And Antiochus ransacked the temple of God. And yet, Israel knew that just like all others, he would powerful as he was he would fall because what goes up must come down history was not a mystery to Israel and God really didn't allow Antiochus to last all that long barely a decade 
And biblical texts and truths like this one opened up and given to the people of God, prepared just for God's people, moving into the time of Christ. This is a gift because this text, this truth, gave the baby church after Jesus' departure back to heaven, gave the baby church great assurance as well because they would face persecutors in the Roman Empire. Persecutors who personified the kind of king that the end of this vision sets forth. Okay, told you that Antiochus, the prophecy, seems to go till about verse 35. The best we can figure, verse 36, seems to mark a shift in the prophecy from, from what was going to happen in those hundreds of centuries right after Daniel to much later, the end of time, we might say. Seems to be a shift at verse 36. And the king shall do as he wills. It doesn't, doesn't say necessarily that we've shifted in prophecy, but it seems so because he shall exalt himself and magnify himself above every god and shall speak astonishing things against the god of gods. Antiochus, he didn't really do that. He didn't really do that. He prayed to the gods. He didn't exalt himself above them. He shall prosper till the indignation is accomplished, for what is decreed shall be done. And then it goes on to describe some things that don't really seem to apply to Antiochus IV Epiphanes, or any other ruler in history. Seems to describe an anti-God ruler who would come later, much later, who we would call the Antichrist. A ruler who would be prefigured by a little antichrist throughout history. Kind of like many, me antichrists that will come. That's what, <coughs> to this slide here, that's what 1 John mentions when he said, you have heard that antichrist is coming. But then he says, so now many antichrists have come, right? There were Roman emperors like Nero. There were powerful nations that as a whole, were antichrists throughout history. There have been, even into our own times, where rulers or groups rise up that are anti-Christ. The young church knew, knew that those antichrists would rise to power. They would defy God, like Antiochus. They would persecute God's people, like Antiochus. They knew it because of the second half of Daniel chapter 11. But, the young church also knew. The young church also knew that, like all the others, any antichrist that rose up in their time would fall. Always fall. Because what goes up must come down. History was not a mystery to the church of Roman times. God would allow that empire to last all that long. Even the great and mighty Roman Empire, he wouldn't allow to last all that long. He would only put up with the back seat of it, of the Rome, that, that is the Roman Empire for all that long. Can't stand it anymore. It's time to cut it off. Rome's strength really meant something. It did. And we still look back on it and say, man, that was strong. It meant something for a while, but it too faded. And it's the same assurance that we have today. It's the same assurance. History is not a mystery to us. We can see from Daniel, maybe better than any other book in the Bible, maybe, that, that God has history mapped out and headed in a certain direction. A direction that is for the good of his people. He doesn't have his magnifying glass out searching for clues to what the next big event in our history is going to be. He's not wondering. And because God has given us a general outline of the remainder of history, it doesn't have to be a mystery to us either. We've gotten to see what God's plan is all about and where it's heading. To see it very similarly to how God sees it all the time. Just to, just to look how God sees it all the time. Most of the details of your life absolutely remain unrevealed. Most of the details of your life remain mysterious. The Bible doesn't give you an itinerary to go by day by day. You should do this, this, and this. This is going to happen here. Watch out for that. That might make things easy. Might not. 
But you know that if the big events have beginnings and ends that are decreed by God, the small ones do too. Is there a mystery to your future history? Yeah, lots of mystery there. Is there uncertainty? No, no there is not. Our world is in many ways very predictable. There's lots of mystery in our world. There are things that only God knows and understands about this place we live in. But he has also put within our world lots of cycles that make things very knowable for us and make many things very predictable for us. Cycles of nature, like the sun rising, or the world turning so that it appears the sun is rising, however you might say it. Rivers refilling. Newton's law, right? It applies to more than just objects in gravity. What goes up must come down. That cycle isn't just woven into nature, it's also woven into history. We see it and we experience it in every generation. Watching the rise and fall of regime after regime, despot after despot. They all rise to great power. They go up and they all fall down. They come down. None of them pursuing God's kingdom ultimately. We see in our world from kingdoms and empires, greed and lust and power struggle. None of them last all that long. God won't allow it. He only puts up with each evil regime's evil for so long. And so even in our time, the strength of those empires means something. It means something for a while. The strength of a, of a United States or the strength of a, a China or a Russia. It means something. But it always fades. It always fades. Think of the relative shortness, especially of the most evil regimes in human history. Relatively short. God doesn't let them extend very far into history, generally. In our world, it is the same predictable pattern every time, which is good news for you, because it means that when you face the worst of the worst personally in your life, you can say, oh, oh yeah, I, I know where this is going. I've got a general idea of, of where this is heading. Because something or someone is going to rise to power, so to speak, in your world. Something or someone anti-God. You may even, at some point in your life, face legit persecution. I don't know. But you know that like all the others that rise in your life or have risen over time, he, she, or it will fall. Because what goes up must come down. History is not a mystery to you. God won't allow anything that is opposed to him to last all that long. So friends, you do not have to be a sleuth in order to gain assurance. No detectives needed. God has already spoiled the big plot so that you can have certainty of ultimate deliverance to whatever ails you. Eternal life with him through Christ. And then also, we know that the end of history is not a mystery. Yeah, absolutely. The details of the end are very much mysterious to us. Very much. Which is why there are so many ideas from so many different believers of what the end will look like. There are so many charts. But the general outline has been handed to us, and that's enough. We can know that when the greatest terror, the terror of all terrors, described at the end of this chapter in Daniel, when that great terror rises at the end of time, if we're alive to see it, we know that it too will fall. The Antichrist will rise to power. Again, we, we started in verse 36. A king who shall do as he wills. What is a king in today's idea? I don't know. Maybe a person, maybe a world system, maybe a government. He or, or it will defy God. Verse 37. He shall pay no attention to the gods of his fathers or to the one beloved by women. He shall not pay attention to any other god, for he shall magnify himself above all. 
he or, or it, whatever this entity is, will persecute the people of God. The way that, that the messenger frames that for Daniel's understanding in the 5th century BC is through war. It's going to happen somehow through some sort of war. Verse 41, he shall come into the glorious land, or wherever the people of God are, and tens of thousands shall fall, but these shall be delivered out of his hand. Edom and Moab and the main part of the Ammonites. Not sure what the equivalent of that is today. Verse 44, but news from the east and the north shall alarm him. He shall go out with great fury to destroy and devote many to destruction. He's going to persecute the people of God at the end in a big way. But just like all the others that have fallen, he too will fall. Verse 45, and he shall pitch his palatial tents. He's, he's going to have a huge army between the sea and the glorious holy mountain, whatever that might look like today. Last verse, yet he shall come to his end with none to help him. We'll look even more closely at that next week. But 2 Thessalonians 2 gives us an idea. Paul picks up on this theme and says, The lawless one will be revealed, whom the Lord Jesus will kill with the breath of his mouth, and bring to nothing by the appearance of his coming. What goes up must come down. God will not allow him or it, whatever this entity or person is, to last all that long. The war of, of Armageddon that's described in Revelation, whatever it might look like, ultimately is going to be pretty short. Between the sea and the glorious holy mountain of Jerusalem. This book has, has taken pains to show us that any antichrist's hold on power over God's people will be relatively short. Jump into chapter 12 with me just for a second. Because at that time, the time where this Antichrist figure is, it has the most power, Michael shall arise, the great prince who has charge of your people. See, it's going to be short. It's going to be cut off like everyone is. Because God's people are going to come in. I love what the poet T.S. Eliot wrote. He said, this is the way the Antichrist ends. Not with a bang. But the glory awaiting the people of God will last forever. Such is the contrast that we'll see again next week. The first two of chapter 12. Many of those who sleep in the dust, the saints of the earth, shall awake, some to everlasting life, some, not saints, to shame and everlasting contempt. And those who are wise shall shine like the brightness of the sky above, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. See the contrast? History is not a mystery. Though your day today is full of little bitty mysteries, for sure, you are not uncertain. You are not uncertain. In Christ, you are secure. And you are simply waiting for the fulfillment of what you know is coming your way. So, church, live confidently. Live reassured in that. Let's pray. Thank you for delivering this word to us, O oh God. You gave it to your people almost 3,000 years ago. You reassured them, gave them confidence moving forward. And it does so for us even now. How living, how active is this word? What truth to see so much prophesied then come to pass in history. Oh God, no one has confidence like we do. Ultimately, Father, our confidence is in the power of our Lord Jesus Christ, who will rule and reign forever. Remind us of that each time we're confronted with a situation, a person, a place, a thing that we think is never going to loosen its powerful grip on us. What goes up must come down, God. You've taught us that. 
deliver your saints soon into eternal bliss, we pray. Oh, Christ, come back. We await your return together. And we worship in the meantime. In the name of Jesus, we pray. Amen. Joy is found. There is no.
before we dismiss. When we do dismiss, we'll dismiss from the back, this side over here, exiting on that aisle, on this side here, one row at a time. So if you're in the back, head that way outside the doors and uh, visit with each other. It's a beautiful day. Thank you for joining us in the live stream today. Um, we're grateful for you. If you uh, have an offering to give, there are a couple of blue boxes in the back there. You can give those today. You can always give online. We appreciate your faithfulness in that during this time. Let's close with a benediction. Church, may you truly walk with your hope set on our Lord Jesus Christ. And with that confidence, may he give you the grace to endure whatever comes. In Christ's name, amen. Yeah.
Thank you.